I'm pretty much down to watch a TV movie on Lifetime any time of day, any day of the year. Why? Because I love a movie that combines the wholesome messaging of an after-school special with the cheap production value of the graduation video your yearbook club made in high school. And we get the best of all of those things with 2009's Queen Size starring Nikki Blonsky. This was one of the first ever Lifetime movies that really impressed upon my soul because when I saw it back as a teenager, I was immediately struck by how messy Messy it was. I was excited to jump back into Queen Size and re-examine this to kind of dissect and see what exactly makes this come off as such a train wreck. Because the story is nice, I like the messaging, and there are real moments of authentic acting, but the soundtrack and the editing are two things that stand out to me as areas of opportunity for this film. Stay tuned for another clip breakdown of Queen Size. Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another clip breakdown. This is a playlist where we examine our favorite movies and media and see what we like about them and what is just hilariously wrong, according to me in my mouth, my sassy, stupid mouth. You guys, the reason I was so into this movie back when it first came out was because of the lead star. But wait, before I get into it, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up if you wanna see even more clip breakdowns like this. But most importantly, if you're new here, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right down there. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week. Turn on notifications. Do, 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 do. Guys, this movie stars Nikki Blonsky, and if you don't know who that is, I'm about to lay it down. Have you seen the movie Hairspray? Oh my gosh. Based on the hit Broadway musical, based on the cult classic by John Waters of the same name. Nikki Blonsky played Tracy Turnblad in that movie, which is an iconic role, and she was plucked from obscurity, cast from just being a normal high schooler to be in that film, so this was the second movie she did after Hairspray. This movie co-stars Annie Potts as Nikki's mom. You might know Annie Potts as the secretary from the Ghostbuster movie. Remember, she was a funny actress and she's good in this as well. Also, this movie was very enlightening about some of the unique customs that go on in Southern high schools because I went to a very Northeast high school and we did not mess around with homecoming queens or elections or parades or all of that. So it was very interesting to see this movie which takes place in North Carolina. Am I doing those accents right, let me know, or I'll just keep going and you can let me know either way. The movie starts by introducing us to Maggie, who is our lead character, a senior in high school who struggles in her daily life because of her weight. You can see at the beginning she has trouble keeping up with the walking tour and she faces a lot of criticism from her mom on a daily basis. Back in 2009, this was a really brave topic because we didn't see a lot of people talking about this, especially not on Lifetime movies, which typically featured women of one body type. So this was a really kind of pioneering step for Lifetime. I don't know why they decided to edit the whole movie on the Windows Movie Maker, but that was a directorial choice. Also, I mean, maybe you can explain. These are probably the worst titles I've ever seen. They're so distracting. Your college applications came. Great, now all I need are good grades and tuition money. We'll figure it out. What in the Willy Wonka is that purple swirly nonsense in my face? I don't A, wanna know what the editor's name was that bad that it needs to flash in front of my face like it's the beginning of Star Wars, and B, just the, the poor readability and the awful font design. Maggie is clearly still suffering because she recently lost her father, who she loved so much that she doesn't have a picture of her with him together. You look good in that picture. But just look at you now. Are you wondering why a magical ghost mom just appeared in Maggie's room to scold her? Me too, it's really sudden, especially since that was our introduction to the plot device that Maggie has this perfect image of her mother that appears in the middle of the room when she's not liking herself. And that 3D wipe is just a taste of the distracting transitions and cuts that they have going on in this movie. I don't know what they were trying to go for here, making it feel like super dynamic and young, but really what it feels like is overproduction to the max because it really cuts short scenes that are supposed to be introducing something that's important that will be coming up throughout the film like this ghost bomb or just emotional moments that I would like to have a minute and let land before they're like oh, whoosh, 
Saved by the Bell next week on The Incredibles or whatever. It seems like there's some girls at this school who are just plain awful to Maggie for her weight, particularly Liz, who is the best friend of the popular girl. The popular girl's name is Tara. I think with this girl group, they've cast some local Louisiana talent. Although the movie takes place at Eagle Ridge, South Carolina, the movie was actually shot in Louisiana. And you can kind of hear those Southern drawls on a few of these actors' voice. What you can't hear is a realistic execution of the dialogue. Relax, hair. You've been class princess last three years, no contest. You're a lock for senior queen. Oh, stop. If you were any more perfect, you'd come shrink craft with a dream house. <laughs> Ooh, I'm glad the screenwriters had a copy of Things Teenagers Never Ever Ever Say. If you were any more perfect, you'd come shrink wrap with a dream house. If I was an actor and I had that in a script, I'd say, hmm, instead of reading these lines, can I just light myself on fire and run screaming into the night? Because that feels more natural. And they would say, wow, actors are difficult. They gave Maggie a little brother for zero reason. I think they were just like, teenagers have siblings, right? Yeah, because we have to suddenly pick him up skateboarding in the ravine. Like he says, I think three lines lines in this whole movie and every time he says them I crack up laughing for no reason. What's for dinner? I don't know what for dinner is but you gotta tell me more about this child actor haircut we got going on. It is the size of Pluto. If you guys don't notice whenever you see a little kid on TV a lot of the times boys will have this big mop of hair. It's because when you're a working actor as a child you gotta keep that hair long especially during sweep season when you're auditioning for new pilots that are being shot for sitcoms. Like if your character needs long hair they're gonna probably consider someone with naturally long hair before someone with short hair where they have to consider are we doing extensions or are we gonna have to get them a wig and it was at its worst in the early 2000s look out for that next time you're watching a movie and you'll be like oh why is that little boy from the monkeys you really get a feel for how basically Maggie feels put upon by her family like her mom works really hard so Maggie has to stay home and take care of her brother all day even though she kind of seems a little incompetent and she doesn't have that many places to go anyway no shade that's what her go mom says to her on the deck. As if you ever have anywhere to go. I thought this was an interesting thing to keep having the perfect mom come back and criticize her. Clearly Maggie feels like hyper criticized and the negative voice inside her head sounds a lot like her mom. So that came across with this choice, but it's so sudden and forced every time and the mom says the most obvious things. And while a lot of the music that's in this movie kind of sounds like it was written by one of those horse girls who took a lot of piano lessons, that sounded judgmental. Um, there are some pretty distracting songs in this movie. But also, there are some early thousands classics randomly peppered in where I'm like, okay, music licensing. They really had the budget for music, but they somehow edited this on PC. Fairy tales Stress eating to a Fergie song in the early thousands is very relatable to me, so that's probably why I've had this movie in my mind for so long. Also, I wasn't even thinking of doing it until I was talking on Twitter with MotoDish38, who was like, you should do Queen Size, and I was like, I've seen it, I've been thinking about it, I'm gonna do it, oh yeah. I was obsessed with Nikki Blonsky in Hairspray, and then I saw a couple scenes in this and I was like, Oh, okay, maybe she was just born to play Tracy Turnblad. But watching it again, I'm like, all right, I take that back. Nikki Blonsky does a good job with most of this movie. There are certain moments where I'm like, what was that choice? But I think a lot of it has to do with direction and the script. So kudos to you, Nikki Blonsky, who is now a lesbian icon. She's in the LGBTQ plus community, and we're here for that. You also see how Maggie is kind of ignored at school. Like her friend, whose name is Casey, gets invited to a party by some guy and they're sort of like, but can you not tell this girl who's right in front of us? But it's fine because Maggie, like we said, usually has to watch her little brother while her mom works late as a social worker. There's a healthy selection in there for you. I have a client in crisis and don't stay up too late. Thank you. You say you have a client in crisis, but I would argue that the real crisis is the fact that you're wearing a skirt over jeans. Something that a lot of teenagers were guilty of in the early days of the thousands. Thanks My Chemical Romance, I would guess. But I don't know what kind of stylist was like, let's put that on a grown woman for this movie. The costumes did not age well here. It's like, remember when everyone was wearing a fitted tank top and every girl ever was like, let's go to Delia's and get some layered tanks. Okay, Nikki, for this scene, all we need is for you to naturally order a pizza like you would 
any other time. I'd like a medium Hawaiian pizza. Okay, that felt a little rehearsed. Basically, Maggie decides to skip out on her brother. She pays for a babysitter to come over and she goes out to that party. Tell me if you love this song by Nelly Furtado. This song was blasting in my little sedan that I drove around in high school full time. She's a man eater, make you work hard, make you sweat hard. I was 16 and I was like, this song is about me while I was driving to my like substance abuse counselor. They were like, no, you know what song's about you? Candle in the wind, why don't you calm down? This simple act of how they used to take pictures of one another feels like something out of a sci-fi movie. Hey, take a picture with me. We were always taking pictures on our digital cameras. This was all we did at any social function was like, let's try to get a good picture of ourselves with the shaky low lighting. And then later you would upload them all to Facebook and tag everybody. And it was the light of my life. It was also a really great way to find out what sleepovers and parties I wasn't invited to. Like a really great open source of anxiety for all of the world's children. That's why we're all doing great. Thumbs up for mental health. Maggie kind of comes off as like invisible or timid in the first few scenes, but then you see her dancing and you're like, oh, okay, I guess she is kind of confident. Like, she seems to be enjoying herself, so I'm a little shaky on her character throughout. For example, we see her changing in the stall at gym class because she would never let anyone see her, but then at the party, she's dancing and shaking her hips and being really out there. So that kind of felt a little incongruent to me, but what do I know? The mean girls, however, especially Liz, they're just awful. Like, they wait till she's about to spill salsa on her and then they take an unflattering photo of her. And while you hear Maggie always talking about how nobody likes her, everyone hates her, you see she gets a fair amount of attention from at least a small group of people like this guy who clearly loves her. But the keg is calling. He's not into me. He's into speaking Spanish with me. This movie is like really notorious for having jump cuts that come in out of nowhere. And I get it. I do those a lot in my YouTube videos, but that's when I need to make a point. Like it's a lot less common in a narrative film. You wouldn't just cut into a close-up when you're in a medium shot if there's no reason. Like you're not showing me any extra detail or an expression that's important to see. And it's very jarred. Also, how can you not think someone has a crush on you? He literally just caressed your face. But I guess when you're in high school, you're naive to that kind of thing. You're like, oh, I probably just had dirt on my face. I wonder how many people were flirting with me in my life. And I was like, I wonder why their eyes are always so dry. Maggie has her first encounter with Tara, the main popular girl who is a shoe in for the homecoming queen, basically. And we can see right off the bat that she's not as bad as the other mean girl, her friend. <laughs> you klutz like me? No, my blouse was just hungry. <laughs> Hey, that's funny. I've never heard a joke before in my life, so I'm gonna go ahead and laugh at that. <laughs> that's not funny. Don't sit here and lie to the audience. Just because you say something was funny doesn't mean I'm gonna go back and be like, yeah, I guess so. Maggie gets called the F out when she gets home. Where'd you get the money in the first place? Took my allowance from your stash. And it's like, okay, you're coming off just a little bit entitled here, Maggie. What's all of this? And she's like, it's the parent's job to watch my little brother. No, it's the parent's job to go to work every day to get the money to pay for all your garbage that you're wearing. Every cap sleeve cardigan that you own is because of me, ma'am. I know that I was an entitled teenager, but now I know that I'm an entitled adult because I look at teenagers and I'm like, mm. I was never like that when I know that I was. The popular girls back at the party are like looking at that unflattering picture they have of Maggie and being like, wouldn't it be so hilarious if we put her on the ballot for homecoming queen? And I don't know how to explain it, but the girl who plays Liz is one of those people who doesn't have braces, but you can tell she did have braces once and now always kind of looks like she has braces. Do you know what I'm talking about? Is that a thing for everybody? Maggie is at home crying about her dad who passed away only a year before due to diabetes and both moms come in, ghost mom and physical realm mother. And you really start to get a feel for how unhelpful the mom's good intentions are. I think you just feel better about yourself if you try to get in shape and got healthy. Do you think I would also feel better about myself if I could weep over my dead dad without being asked to join Weight Watchers? Thanks, honey. Love you. When I started watching this movie, my mind was really distracted by all of the crazy clunky editing. But this part when we have our featured extra giving an iconic line is really where I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna sit back and enjoy this movie. And I found myself having a much easier go of it from that point on. What? Check the bulletin board. <laughs> Check the bulletin board. 
Hair flip of the century. I love her. Give her an Oscar. Wig snatched. So to the horror, the complete horror of Maggie, her name has been put on the ballot with that unflattering picture. As someone who has built salsa on everything that I've ever worn, I get it. This sucks. I bet you a lot of people were done dirty by the flash photos on digital cameras back in the early thousands. Like I would look like a plain piece of white paper with two black dots for an eye and then any pimple was a cherry red spot. Digital cameras were the worst. You couldn't put that on Facetune. It was nuts. It was the Thunderdome out there. And they just went and printed that out and put it on a poster. I would be livid. Something that comes up a couple times in this movie is characters getting key information from two faceless gossiping teens who are always in the bathroom doing their business while chatting about the school. They're kind of like the Greek muses of ancient mythology. If I had read any of that, which I haven't. This has a very deus ex machina feel to it, I think. I would totally vote for Maggie. I would vote for Tara, but that's like voting for Liz and I'd sooner punch myself in the face. <laughs> Why don't we all take a moment to punch ourselves in the face? Who gave you guys those shoes to wear? I want to see the girl who's sitting on the toilet wearing these shoes. I need to see the face. I need to see the makeup choices. What is the hairstyle? I picture all of the girls from the Babysitter's Club if they grew up and got toxic personalities. I'm obsessed with the Babysitter's Club, okay? I've been listening to the books on tape lately. They just make me feel good. Back at home, Maggie's mom is clearly worried about her participating in this homecoming race, which Maggie is starting to be like, I'm going to actually do it. And her mom's like, no, you should really drop out. People have a certain idea of what it's gonna look like. So not super supportive or in any way believing that this is anything but gonna be a heartful, cruel joke to her daughter, which sends Maggie right out the door to the ice cream store. And I really appreciate the way they try to link Maggie's stress or lack of acceptance at home with the way that she kind of acts out and overeats as a way to numb. I think that's something that a lot of people can relate to, especially people who struggle with weight issues or even have binge eating eating disorder, which is something that's really difficult to people to live with. So I love that they were touching upon this in the movie. Sometimes it feels a little obvious. Like she's like, I'm mad, so I'm gonna cry while eating a cupcake. And I don't know that that is always that clear uh, on its face, but in any case, I appreciate the way they try to make it clear for us how this is her coping mechanism. Can I please taste the slender strawberry? Okay. Why bother with the locale, darling? Just give me a scoop of the chocolate peanut butter crunch and make it a double. I know in her mind she sees her evil mom here, but she just kind of asked that in a really rude way to a real ice cream worker. She was like, make it a double. And that lady was like, okay. Okay. There are several moments where Maggie talks to her imaginary mom and is like, I'm gonna kill you. But she's talking directly to her best friend, Casey, and no one says anything. So I'm guessing she's not actually speaking out loud to these people. Some girl approaches Maggie at this place and is like, I'm so happy you're running for things. It's great to see an underdog on that ballot for one. So that gives Maggie the courage to actually be like, you know what? I am not gonna drop out of this race. I'm gonna hang up posters like a real girl. And at first Casey is like, the mean girls who wanna win are just gonna make your life hell. It's actually kind of a nice galvanizing moment for Maggie where she's like, for the last three years of high school, I felt worthless. And a lot of times people treat me like I'm worthless and I'm just gonna put my name on the ballot because I wanna feel different for once. And that feels really cool. It's like, yeah, Maggie, you better work. But that instantly draws attention from not only the mean girls who put her in this position in the first place, but also some of the school staff. She's making a mockery of the whole election process. Anyone intending to run for homecoming queen must submit at least 150 signatures. Um, objection, okay? Because Miss wakes up at 5 a.m. to straighten her hair every day over here is the one who put my picture on that ballot. So how am I the one making a mockery of it when she was literally trying to mock me when she put me up there? That's what I would say, but instead Maggie's playing it a lot more cool. She probably had to take a lot fewer mental health days than I did in high school because her temper is better in this situation. She's basically like, I should have a chance. If I get the 150 signatures, it's on. And this is where I was like, okay, this must be a Southern school thing. Like we had to get votes and stuff for your school president, but having like a freshman, sophomore, junior princess and a homecoming queen, what? That was not a thing. We had a homecoming prom type of deal, but voting for a homecoming queen, that feels really Southern. Let me know if you're from that area, from like North Carolina, South Carolina, the Southern, more states of that, and such 
as the states within the borders of below the Ecuadors. Is it a Southern thing? Let me know. Maggie's quest to get 150 signatures to join the ballot sort of serves as a montage that kind of shows us building her confidence a little bit more. Basically, everybody is like, I want to vote for Maggie because voting for Tara, who is kind of nice, is basically like voting for Liz, her awful friend, and we're tired of that. So Liz, you're counting against yourself as the campaign manager over here. But not everybody is on board with Maggie being the face of all of the underdogs, which I think is a valid counterpoint. I think this whole underdog thing is really stupid. You're sending a message to the pretty popular people that we all want what they have. Some of us chose to be different. But some of us didn't. That could have been a very interesting moment where we see two different perspectives from people who are of similar social standing, but instead of seeing how that conversation resolved itself, or even letting that moment breathe, we got that zoom in cut that we had on the Hannah Montana series. I was half expecting it to be like, ooh, ooh, wow, how? Is this supposed to be an emotional, powerful thing or a Nickelodeon show, honey? Without meaning to, you can really see the mom like completely showing her lack of faith in her daughter. She's like, listen, don't take this too seriously. In 20 years, you won't even remember who was your homecoming queen. And Maggie's like, um, I will if I win. And the mom is totally gooped. She's like, Oop. that plus some other microaggressions, like feeding her something different than the brother. She's like, oh, and there's a healthy selection in the fridge for you. It's like, wow, you just really don't miss any opportunity to remind her that she's less than or different or somehow not living up to your standards. Like I can see that she really cares about her daughter and she's trying to say all the right things, but it just comes off really wrong. And I could always see why Maggie would get super defensive and, and be like, what is that supposed to mean all the time? The mother-daughter dynamic was the best part of this whole movie. I was like, yes. Thanks to the valiant effort of all of her friends, Maggie has just about enough signatures to get on the ballot. But in a rushed series of flash cuts, we realized someone broke into the locker at night. And from the sly looks she was giving, we have a pretty good idea that it was Liz, the best friend of Tara, trying to sabotage sabotage Maggie to make sure she can't compete, but of course she denies having anything to do with it. This is another point where I feel like they kind of crammed in some of this. This is how she deals with her emotions, by showing her outside eating while crying in the open. I guess what we can do is just appreciate the representation that Lifetime is giving us here, because they are miles ahead from their competitors over on Hallmark, who are like, have we had a skinny blonde girl on the screen in more than two seconds? Okay, let's bring in a few. Her friends are basically like, listen, we know all of your signatures got stolen and we know that the school doesn't seem to care about you at all in terms of like disciplining the people who broke into your locker but we're gonna get back all of these signatures so they go back out and they get more signatures again and we have another signature hunting montage which is to me two signature hunting montages more than we really needed especially when they were only 30 seconds apart by having them get stolen midway through like how many people do I need to see this clipboard get handed to why does their science teacher look look like he's an ice cream mixologist at the Ben and Jerry's factory. If a teacher is wearing a tie-dye lab coat, I don't think you have to sneak in behind his back to get some signatures for a school assembly. Like, he's one of the cool ones. You're okay there, bro. It's a race against the clock, but Maggie gets all of the signatures she needs. But again, the editing in certain areas is just completely unforgivable. Like, how many different cuts between two people do you need to have a simple shot of someone taking a picture of another person? You're officially on the ballot. Say crummy! Did someone just learn how to use iMovie effects for the first time? And also, in what world do we need to see person A, person B, with no exchange of dialogue whatsoever? It makes the pacing seem so unnatural. Also, I love in Lifetime movies when they end on a scene like that, and all you can do is hold on the person smiling. And since they don't have any lines, they just give you that smile breathing where they're like, My name's on the prom ballot. camera flash. Like, okay, just end the scene. It's okay to end the scene. All is not well if we check in on the relationship between Tara and Liz. You can kind of see the cracks starting to form in this popularity regime. Also, we can learn some really cool early thousands slang that I'm pretty sure never existed. You really don't think this outfit makes me look too, like, skankoid? No. I'd definitely wear it if I was nominated. 
That girl is envious. I know teen jealousy, okay? When I was in high school and somebody got something that I wanted, I would fill out a bunch of magazine subscriptions in their name and have them billed to their address. And it's healthy to do things like that, okay? Commit the revenge act, just do it. No one's gonna care. I'm just kidding, be nice to each other. However, I do like that we get to see a little bit of why Liz is so obsessed with making Tara the prom coming queen. It's like, what is your hang up girl? While the mom is all obsessed with Maggie filling out her stupid college applications, Maggie is now completely in it to win it with the homecoming thing. And she's like, gotta figure out my dress and my hair. And the mom is like, oh, I'm sorry. Did you forget that we're poor? Okay, I'll fill out the applications, but I really need help with the dress. Why don't you wear my superhero cape? Okay, Tyler, we're not really here for your lines, so if you're gonna just jump in and say stupid crap every two minutes, we're gonna have to really reduce your role. We appreciate that you came in with your hair styled to look exactly like a kiwi, but we're not loving the chemistry that you bring to this family. What age is he? Before he was see he was skateboarding in a ravine, and now he's like a toddler who thinks she would wear a superhero cape? The mom is basically like, I hope you don't win because we can't afford a dress for you. It'd be better for us if you don't go to the dance. So the mom clearly has some work to do when it comes to communicating with her daughter like girl there are a lot of conversations here where I'm like are you trying to make her cry you know that she's a real sensitive girl and she's like so I just got all the signatures I need it seems like people are really starting to like the idea of me winning and the mom is like really you when Maggie comes in the next day and sees the posters of her competition including Tara she gets a little intimidated Ooh, but more importantly, we get our second use of this Sum 41 song, and I was obsessed with Sum 41 in high school. I was like, because you don't know us at all, we laugh when old people fall, but what do you expect with the conscience so small? Thumbs up if you loved Sum 41 and they fed your punk rock soul as a youngster. But look at these posters, they're stunning. Graphic design is my passion. The thought of being up against such a tall, slender, pretty woman really sends Maggie into a panic attack. And this was one of the most raw, emotional, and real scenes in the whole movie. Maybe it was a little melodramatic, but for me, it was actually very attention grabbing and is the first time that we see like kind of the hurt and frustration come to the surface of Maggie and her whole weight issue and her relationship with her mom. She comes home and her brother's like, what's going on? And she's like, get the hell out of here. And she takes the ice cream out of the fridge in the most disorganized way possible. How could you let me get so fat? <laughs> Very powerful, right? You can really sense the frustration there. I thought that was nice, a moment of acting there. Nikki Blonsky and Annie Potts were definitely into their roles here. I feel like they wanted to bring authenticity to them, and they did that. It's just like the execution of this film is very low budget, TV oriented, cast party at the Dairy Queen afterward. There's a little bit of confusion for me when basically the next day Maggie goes in and she's like, I think this is too much for me. I can't handle the stress of this whole election. And the teacher's like, I think you should drop out. And instantly Maggie's like, how dare you? I'm not gonna drop out. To me, I was like, well, I thought you were just about to do that. Although I do understand that like, that might've been her intention before she was asked to drop out and then she's like, oh, you want me to drop out? Well then, guess what? I'm in it to win it. Nothing is as satisfying as not letting a teacher get their way. I do remember that much about being in high school or college, especially like I had this 3D graphic design teacher in college who I just could not let get the last word. And I was like, I get it that I'm the worst right now, but I'm into that for this class. Righteous indignation when you're a teenager, it's so potent, it's like mm. Her involvement in this election is starting to get noticed because even the goth girl is like, you stood up to Liz, and I think that's cool. But Liz is really not into this headway that her opponent is making, and she has another moment of breaking into a school. Now, I went to high school in 2009, and there was absolutely no school in America that you could just walk into after dark, or that wouldn't have the hallway completely covered in cameras. Like, this is post-Columbine, honey. You can't just come in with a spray paint at midnight. I don't know how she got in there this time, or before when she pried open the locker. I don't know why the school doesn't seem to care about that. They're like, oh, someone keeps coming in and menacing our hallways at night. Do you feel like maybe we should do something to figure out why that's happening? It seems to be causing a lot of turmoil between 
some student, and the teachers are like, no, 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 we're not gonna worry about that. I'm sure it's just Batman or some other masked vigilante trying to maintain justice. It's not our place to worry about the safety of this school, okay? Because Liz actually destroys Tara's posters, it obviously looks to the teacher who has this frumpy red hairstyle that Maggie was the one who did it, even though it seems like you would instantly get caught if you defaced your opponents. Like, she, it just doesn't seem super believable right off the bat, but the teacher's like, obviously, Maggie did it because she's a fat loser. Like, come on. Where's the guidance counselor in all of this? Maybe we don't need one horrible woman to be in charge of every student fight, right? We should delegate that. I vividly remember watching this movie when it came out and seeing this next line happen and thinking, oh, so we're just openly copying Mean Girls. I'm voting for Maggie. I don't think she wrecked Tara's posters. I'm voting Maggie because I think she did. You walk a very fine line when you're trying to make a movie that's really derivative of another more superior movie. Like, as soon as I saw that, I realized, oh, when they were writing this movie, they were trying to make it have the same energy and feel as Mean Girls. And then it all kind of becomes glaringly obvious. And they're obviously playing with a lot of the same ideas like social hierarchy amongst young people. So when they blatantly copied that iconic line about getting hit by a bus from Mean Girls, I was like, oh, the reference just became really obvious and embarrassing. So good on ya. Oh, but then Annie Potts comes in and she serves a monologue. She gives us stand up for my daughter realness. Some skinny girl was made fun of, so let's just heap all the blame on the overweight girl. If your daughter had been attacked in the same way, you would demand we take action. My daughter has been teased, harassed, and ridiculed from the moment she crossed the threshold of this school three years ago. And the only time you have taken any action is when you told her to quit the campaign. What kind of message is that, Miss Gabriel? You better work, angry mother. I love that Annie Potts. That was like West Wing level argumentation. I could tell that I was invested in this movie because when that happened, I was like, oh, why don't you shove that in your library? book miss whatever your name is why don't you take that put it in your permanent record and file it away inside your dry dusty home the teacher basically instantly backs off because she's been told what's what I just love that she points out all of those contradictions like at the beginning of the movie we had people openly calling Maggie awful names about her weight and the teachers were like well so like I said the story it really touches on some moments where I'm like yeah but the editing and the story writing is just like so atrocious it doesn't do this story justice whatsoever oh by the way do you you guys love that I have a little shelf for my aloe plant over here now. The good people at Banish Skincare saw me abusing that guy by punching it accidentally every video, and they sent me this really nice shelf that matches everything beautifully. So now we're safe and healthy over here. When they announced that Maggie has officially been elected as homecoming queen, I could not help but join in on the celebration. I was in, I was sucked into the story of Maggie. That's how I know that, you know, Nikki did a good job with this character. Maggie. Baker. Good job, Maggie. Good job, Maggie. Sorry I called you a lard ass yesterday. Meanwhile, Casey, the best friend, is actually starting to have a burgeoning relationship with one of the popular boys who's been courting her since the beginning of the movie. That really kicks up Maggie's insecurity. She's like, your friends are pulling away from you. Just that this is kind of a big deal and you didn't tell me about it. Can someone point me out to where we've printed the list of rules for high school? Because how did everybody know when to start clapping for this girl? She's been elected prom queen. That means we applaud her when she eats her chicken sandwich from the cafeteria. Everybody clap for the court of the homecoming queen. Is the South England? Where do we get all this pomp and circumstance from? I love it. I wish I had gone to a Southern school because there seems to be a lot more pageantry and that appeals to my gay soul. Because she's not like every other candidate and she was added to the ballot as a joke, the news becomes interested in Maggie's story. I see looks all the time that people give me. Like just now, when I took a bite of the cookie, you were thinking, should she really be eating that? I'm sorry. I was actually just distracted because I've never seen anybody put a piece of cookie in their mouth that unnaturally. I'm just gonna put it out there. It's hard to eat on camera in a way that's realistic, especially when you're coordinating it with talking. And that really shows in that little clip. I'm gonna try it. I see how people look at me. See, that's how I would do it. Some realistic chewing. I see the way people look at me. That's how I would do it. I see the way people look at me. I am not denying that size discrimination is not an issue that people deal with every day, but the fact that Maggie is talking to an actual minority who is the reporter, it does seem a little dismissive on her part of the very real struggle that might bring. No offense, Miss Phillips, but you wouldn't. You're thin and pretty. I grew up a black woman in an all-white community in Minnesota. 
I had my share of problems. And I'm sure somebody told those kids that were mean to you that they were being racist. It just seems like it's okay for people to hate fat people. That didn't age well. Maggie really just said, no offense, but your blackness is nothing compared to my fatness. Ooh! The reporter's like, you know what? I think I'm actually gonna switch over to that article about the Rubber Duck Festival next week. Meanwhile, at school, Maggie is completely alienating her friends. Like, Casey has this big breakthrough with her new boyfriend, and Maggie doesn't even have time for it. Meanwhile, between Tara and Liz, Liz is showing her crazy face a little more easily these days. She's keeping it less contained. You're just gonna let her take what's ours? Liz, please tell me you didn't with the spray paint. No, I didn't. <laughs> But would it really be so bad? Liz could really use some guided meditations to get in touch with what's important here. She's like, you're really just gonna let her take what's important to us? Homecoming queen, don't you need to get into college or something? You need to get right with you. Take up some paint by numbers, I don't know. Sand art might be a fun hobby, something that differentiates you from this homecoming royalty business, cause that seems a little short-sighted. And this next scene, this one has stuck in my mind as something that defines Lifetime movies for me forever. I remember seeing this as a young teenager and being like, what? But I lost. So can you please just let me drink my latte, take a breath, and forget this whole thing ever happened? You saw how she was. It's senior year. She won't get another chance to be queen. Can you please just let me drink my latte, take a deep breath, and enjoy the rest of my senior year? It's like, I would love for you to enjoy that latte. The thing is, it's clearly an empty cup. All three of these teenagers are carrying empty cups and it's so distractingly obvious. Don't talk about your latte when you're holding a paper cup, Missy. I'm gonna notice that. How much work would it be to put liquid inside one of these cups? Doesn't even have to be real coffee. If they don't drink coffee, put water in there. Despite Tara being like, back off, I lost, just let Maggie have the award. The boyfriend is like, but what if we try to kill her instead? They don't literally try to kill her, but they do try to mess with this parade float that for some reason exists and tamper with it so that she falls off of it and is so embarrassed that she quits. But Casey is on the case. She's in the bathroom and we hear those two girls who now have even uglier shoes than before. They're like, we're gonna go watch her fall and watch this thing collapse, right? If you were to sit on something and then it collapsed in front of everybody, that's really embarrassing. So I buy that this is a mean thing to do, but for such a suspenseful scene, they really ruin it because the whole time leading up to Maggie having to sit inside of this rigged chair, they're playing this like feel good reggae island music that totally undercuts what's supposed to be like, what's gonna happen? Also, as usual, we get a million different cuts of a million different people's faces that we don't need. <laughs> Our school has not seen such chaos or destruction since the boiler exploded and killed the on-site janitor. One, two, three, four, five individual cuts just to show her sitting down. What? What? And the music seems like it's from a completely different movie entirely. They could have put more of that Sum 41 and it probably would have fit better. The culprits are very lightly threatened by the teacher being like, well, it's a good thing none of you had anything to do with this or that would be hazing and you would be expelled. When it was Maggie who had nothing to do with the posters being destroyed, you were ready to kick her out of the race just on that alone. But these people could have really hurt somebody. They're just like, oh, you live to kill another day. The double standard is very upsetting and it makes me feel like being a teenager was unfair as hell. It just is, no one liked it. Tara is completely on to Liz and they have a big falling out where she's like, you need to get off my coattail. And basically Liz is like, well, I couldn't get enough signatures to run, so this is my only taste of being popular is helping you. So all of that comes to a head and they're basically done being friends for the rest of the movie. But because of all of this turmoil, Maggie gets invited to be on the morning news and that's very exciting. She has to go buy a new outfit. Meanwhile, the woman who works at the plus size clothing store is the positive energy light force that we all need in our lives. I want this person to be my friend. Even if she does randomly pepper in statistics into normal conversation at a rate that I don't think feels believable, you think with the average size being 14 in this country, they'd make some plus size jeans that fit right. So? Girl, you look 
good. I do look good. Thank you so much, Patricia. I hope she gets a high commission rate for those sales because I felt better for having shopped there. The whole school is a buzz talking about Maggie on TV, just like this green screened Blackberry. They're like, we really got to show one person's hands typing, hey, check out Maggie. That way everyone will know what's going on in this movie. Maggie, during her interview, <laughs> comes on a little strong and probably doesn't think about how this is gonna be received by the rest of her peers at school. When I first was nominated, nobody backed me up. So you were a one woman army against these bullies. You bet. I faced everybody putting me down. I ran a really hard campaign and I won. And you've proved success is the best revenge. I guess I did. This seems like a soft fluff piece. I don't know why they're having a Nancy Grace type interview her. She's like, so you were a one woman army against this violent horde of assaulting students at at your school. And Maggie's like, yes, they stuck knives into my heart the minute I woke up. She makes no mention of her friends who helped her get all of those signatures. And even beyond that, 150 people signed your petition twice. So it's a little unfair to make out your whole school to be a bunch of shallow people who didn't want you to succeed. This causes a big blowout between Casey and Maggie. And it ends with a physical altercation that I was like, oh, Crap. I didn't know Maggie was for the streets like this. Nothing really changes unless you change and you haven't. You're just jealous because I'm famous. Like I want to be the most famous fat girl in South Carolina. <laughs> it seems like that other guy in the scene saw Casey falling and was like, oh my God, let me catch you with my bike tire. It was like final destination, perfect timing. This shove gives Casey a wound on her face and that's very bad. It causes Maggie to be suspended for three days, but she's still allowed to come to homecoming and get crowned homecoming queen. But for the other opponent, Tara, there is no love lost between her and her former best friend, Liz. Loser. User. Oh my lord, these girls are fighting at school over the homecoming crown. I just knew this would happen. Maggie and Tara also talk in the bathroom and Tara admits that she voted for Maggie and she never wanted to be homecoming queen. So that's nice. That's very touching. Back at work, I guess, the mom is talking to her best friend who we've never met in this whole movie, but for some reason comes in to reinforce basically the psychological underpinnings of this whole movie. So, I mean, they could have maybe established his character earlier on just so I'm not like, oh, it's all being explained to me by this wise redhead. It doesn't matter that you have good intention. Maggie thinks that all you see when you look at her is a fat girl, a disappointment. Maggie ran for homecoming and won. Do you get the strength that it takes at 17 to stand up and say, just because I'm fat doesn't mean that I don't have qualities worth admiring. I couldn't do that at her age. I really like this moment because it really hammered home for me exactly how the mom's attempts at helping Maggie have been a little more hurtful than helpful. And it also kind of helps solidify Maggie's character for me more where they're like, she has a really strong personality. She was willing to get her name on that ballot even after it was a joke and run and she won. I just wish that they would have shown me that arc a little bit more like really hammered home that she was put upon and quiet and sheepish like show me her not dancing at that party all wild and crazy but not speaking up in class when people are mean to her she's kind of outspoken and a little bratty like throughout the beginning part of the movie so it's just well all in all she's not a perfect character which I think is a good thing though once again Maggie is being terrorized by her inner voice who is dressed up like her mom at a dinner function and we really finally get to the crux of who this voice is and why she's so negative all the time. Just stop it, I'm so sick of you. Nothing is ever good enough for you. The whole world treats me like I'm worthless, but nobody treats me as worthless as you just to just go away. Did you see that secret Outlast deodorant go flying? That means she's having an emotional breakthrough. No, I really do like how the mom turns into her and we realize, oh, it's you who's hating on yourself this whole time. Maggie gets some inspiring messages from people who saw her on TV saying, you helped me realize that I can go for my dreams and I'm just as worthy as everyone else. But what is she gonna wear? She still doesn't have anything to wear for this and she's feeling less than. Her mom has already handled it. She talked to someone else who saw her on the news and she managed to get her everything she needed for her Cinderella story. And how does one prepare for prom night without a dizzying revolving shot? What's all this? Well, we're gonna do your hair and your makeup and we got you a fabulous dress. Mama figured it out. Mama figured it out. 
Okay, Mom, well, can you stop walking and twirling around me? I'm trying to watch you. You're making my eyes cross here. Gee. Like, am I here to get a haircut or you're putting me on a merry-go-round? Gee whiz. Also, this is the point where we start hearing this very distracting song that has been stuck in my head ever since I watched this movie a day ago, where she's like, I'm alive, I'm alive. It feels very much like a church song, but that's okay because we have 16 shots of her looking at earrings in the mirror. My favorite parts of this whole movie are seeing those little worm earrings dangle while she goes around, that's a lie, it's a lie. Like that got me pumped up for some reason. Woo, yes, homecoming. No wonder these Southern kids get into it. It's like very emotional, huh? Maggie gets wheeled out onto the stage and I just don't like this parade float. It's so rinky dink that it looks like they've got her in a wagon. But regardless, when she first stands up to give her speech, the people are kind of booing because they still don't love her admonishing them on live TV, but she gives a pretty watered down emotional speech that gets everybody to come around. You can see, because even the jocks on their faces, they're like, oh, we're learning. Potty, burnout, fat girl aren't who we are, but they're just how we appear. Oh, she doesn't like it when I call her a cow in the hallways. Great seeing those guys learn manners for the first time right before becoming legal adults. We've got that song coming right back about how alive she is. And although Casey is trying to do a slow clap here that would maybe be suspenseful, like is the school gonna accept her? Are they not? You kind of know which direction it's heading based on the buildup of this very lyrical song. I'm sorry, I'm trying to enjoy the movie. Can we turn down the vocals on Mary Sue, guitar player up here? We can bring her back when we need some church hymns recorded. Thank you. The movie ends with voiceover and I just hate a movie that only uses voiceover at the opening and the closing to set it up. Like it, we basically don't need it in that case. And it also ends on a freeze frame, which is just like, why don't you shoot some more video that you can put some narration over if that's what you're gonna do. I faced my fears and I did it in a kick-ass dress. I guess the dress was somehow important. It's like we never had a moment where she stepped out of the closet and we were like, oh, wow, she looks so stunning. We had this makeover moment that makes us realize she has self-worth now. They could have really built that in, could have seen more of an arc for her character, but instead, why don't we just bring back some more of that song? Yes, I am alive. So alive, queen size, living for it. So all in all, not a bad story. I would say I really enjoyed the mother-daughter dynamic and I liked seeing some of these nuances that put me in the perspective of somebody in Maggie's position. But man, was that editing so rough and outside of a couple great songs that I loved, um, the music was hyper distracting and everything felt like diet mean girls. What do you guys think of queen size? Where does this fall on your list of favorite lifetime movies? For me, it's up near the top, along with some others, such as Mommy's Little Girl, which I love, love, love. Let me know what your thoughts on this movie was. Do you like Hairspray and Nikki Blonsky? I think she's gonna hit TV again soon. Anyway, let me know. Also give this video a big thumbs up if you wanna see even more clip breakdowns just like this. There's a whole playlist below. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right down there. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week. Thank you so much for being elected homecoming queen with me today, y'all. You guys are all the greatest. I will see you next time. Bye.